All right, we're gonna start with, hopefully this looks very familiar from the exercise six. We're on exercise six, right? So this is the style of question on exercise six. Here are two separate sorting algorithms with some intermediary steps. I will tell you the first line is the very initial state and then the subsequent lines are can, not necessarily consecutive but in order different states of the algorithm. So go ahead and look at these two different algorithms. The Slido should be active and see if you can determine which algorithm is which. And I will tell you right now, since we only learned three algorithms on Monday, your choices are insertion sort, selection sort, or merge sort. So dust off those cobwebs and let's check back in in three minutes. Okay, cool. All right, let's talk about it. Usually I see a lot of like wonderful gesturing, like, oh, like I love it. Like we're talking to each other and we're pointing and everybody pointed and then very quickly everybody started looking at their phones. And so I'm going to assume that means this is an un unfun style of question. So let's do it together so you can make sure you can do it on your exercise. Yeah? Okay. Should we look at... Have we voted on the Slido? Should we look at that first? Let's see, maybe drum roll, I'm gonna pop over. Let's see what's happening. Oh, wait, okay. I always think I'm so smart to like open it in a new tab. What? Dead tie. Ooh, let's see. I could have sworn I had. I had it pulled up. That's what I, I was like ready for it, but whatever. Okay. Ooh, 93 votes. Okay, let's see. Ooh, okay. So we have a dead tie. It seems like we are pretty, pretty much in agreement that the first one is selection, but we can't decide between merge or insertion. Uh-oh, uh-oh, <laughs> for the second one. Okay, let's go back over and I was smart enough to not put the answers on the slide for one, so we can actually have a real reveal here, the drama. Okay, um, okay, let's start with sort one. I will tell you selection is correct. Can anybody tell me what they saw in sort one that indicated to them that they were like, oh, that is selection? Yes, please. Because you have what? A swap. A swap, absolutely. So if I'm looking at this, this is my initial input state. And then if I look down here, I see right away that the very first item in index zero is immediately the smallest item in the entire list. And that happens to be 11. And if I look at where 11 was previously, I see that's what was previously at index zero. So I can tell what happened between this step and this step is that I looked through the entire collection, I found the absolute smallest value, and then I swapped what was currently at zero with that thing I found. And then you can see if we kind of like continue down that the, as it's progressed, it's got like the final sorted order for the first few entries until we get back to unsortedness. And remember, those are all things of selection sort that they're, they're swapping that it is the one that it will find the final resting place for each position in sequence, meaning if you're just looking for the top K number sorted, selection sort will work for you and then you can return if you don't need to sort the entire thing. Any questions on how we figured that one out? Okay. Do we want to play debate whether it's insertion or merge sort? I know nobody feels comfortable like going out on a limb in a lecture, but we're friends by this point, right? Who cares if you're right or wrong? Nobody cares. Um, does anybody want to tell us something they see in sort number two that they're like, ooh, I think that made me think, and then what sort it might make you think? Yeah. Ooh. 
Mm -hmm. So if we look at this original set, we can see that the difference between this line and this line is that we've sorted 2 and 27, they stayed in their original spot, so that's kind of hard to see. But we can see that 12 and 18 have been swapped, as if we sort of looked at 12 and 18 as a pair and sorted that pair. And then if we come down here, we can see that we've sort of got all of the back half of the array still in its original state, but now we've sort of like got the front half of the array sorted. And so it's been kind of moving in these sort of pairs that grow in sorted order. Does anybody see anything else that they're like, oh, that made me think it's this or that? Anybody else want to offer anything? Yes, please. Mm -hmm. uh, and I feel like there is still a lot of disorder at the insertion where we come to, especially in the data set. Yes. I agree. It's a, it's a weird pattern, right? Because like when we looked at merge sort on the slides, and that's why I really wanted to look at this one together as a group. When we looked at merge sort on the slides, I drew them in that sort of like, we broke everything out and it was all like on its own sort of separate line and then everything kind of came back together. So it was like we broke down to ones and then we got into twos and across the entire array. But I didn't at any point sort of go through and talk about, well, since this is going to be recursively programmed, how is that going to sort of like accomplish order wise the sorting throughout the entire array? And that's something we probably haven't done together type of thing. So this does happen to be merge sort, but because of that and like what our friend just said, I was sort of thinking, oh, I don't know if you fairly could recognize that from the way that I illustrated it on the slides. So the way that this works is that it, remember, it triggers a recursive call, and every time it triggers a recursive call that re triggers a recursive call, it's like a literal call stack. That's what we f refer to, the thing that stores the order of method calls that we make as we go. It's like as we're running a method, as soon as we hit another method call, we interrupt that method and we push a new method call on top of it. So if you think about the order in which recursion is resolved, it actually kind of follows almost like a depth first search kind of thing where it's like we sort of like explore all the way down through one recursive call stack to resolve it. And so the way that it ends up resolving itself in terms of the array order is that it sort of like breaks down into pairs in the first half and then it combines the pairs into the four and then it combines the four into the first half and then it goes into the second half and then it breaks those into second pairs because remember the very first set of recursive calls that are made trigger a recursive call to the first half of the array and then a recursive call to the second half of the array. So the ordering actually, it ends up sorting the entire first half before it sorts the second half. If you're like, Casey, there's no way I could possibly visualize that shenanigan that you just waved around with your hands. I have a resource for you. And I realized I hadn't shown you this resource. Has anybody here found Visual Algo yet as part of this course? Okay, I should mention this more often. So Visual Algo, as you can see, visualgo.net, and I'm sorry it's got a dark theme so it's a little hard to see there. Um, if you go to the main page of this, it has visualizers for most of the algorithms that we've covered and some other ones. And what it has is it has a way for you to just sort of walk through step by step of a bunch of visualizations of algorithms. It also has a way for you to put in your own numbers and then it'll sort them or do apply the algorithm to them in the order that you can watch. But if we come in here and we look at merge sort, it just generated some random numbers for us. And so I'm gonna press sort. And so what it's gonna do now is there, it takes the first two, you can see what's happening on the right hand side is it's highlighting the bits of code that are run and I know this is going really fast, but you can see down here on the bottom, there's like a pause function. So if you wanna do it, and you can go step by step, which is really convenient. But here, I'm just gonna let this run so you can see, see how it sort of did the first half, it broke the first half all the way down and then it recombined and then there we go, we're just about done with the first half. Now the first half is all sorted. 
And that ends that first recursive call. And now here's that second recursive call in that initial level where it's breaking down that first pair. Now we're interweaving those because there's an odd number. There we go. And then we do that. Great. Now we're going to interweave these three. And then you can see we're going to eventually interweave that entire second half. There we go. We're merging them. And now we've got two sorted halves. And then it's going to merge each of these items until we get a final sorted set. Any questions? So if you get stuck on your homework too, hopefully this is helpful. Yeah? Okay. Yay! Huzzah! Okay. Great. Okay. So that is selection and merge. Let's move on. Okay. So my main announcement today is we have our final exam next week, um, which I know feels weird in week nine, but just remember how much more relaxed your finals week will be, right? Theoretically, maybe not. Okay, so the final exam, remember, is Friday, May 26th. Um, it's gonna be here in class. It's gonna follow the same order as before. You can bring as many paper notes as you want. Maybe we've learned some lessons from the first go around that actually making one of those like optimized, really concise, easy to look through note sheets that there's actually help in doing that. So maybe think about doing that. Um, the topics for the final exam that could be on it are from weeks five through eight. Meaning this week, everything this week could be on the exam, but obviously nothing next week <laughs> will be on the exam. Um, so that includes heaps, all of the graph units, so that graph modeling where we sort of ask you to come up with the ideas and apply them to graphs, and then you can take all of your graph algorithms, your BFS, your DFS, your Dijkstra's, your topological sort, your MSTs, i.e. Kruskal's and Prim's, all of that stuff is in scope, if you will, uh, disjoint sets, and then sorting algorithms. I will tell you, technically, it's through week eight. On Friday, we're actually going to move on to a topic called dynamic programming. There is not going to be dynamic programming on the exam. That would be, like, cruel. <laughs> um, but I, I'm saying week eight because we might not finish everything I want to say to you about sorting today. So, you know, maybe some part of Friday. Does anyone have any questions about the exam? What? Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, it's one of those things where these are the topics that are still applied, but, you know, all of the stuff that builds on itself is still relative. Like, we're probably going to ask you to evaluate runtime, for example. We're still going to ask you to evaluate memory space, things like that. So you can't just forget all that stuff. But when it comes to like the data structures and algorithms, this is it. Thank you, wonderful TAs. Okay, I'm going to pull up the Slido in case there are questions that we don't feel comfortable saying aloud. Let's see, why did I not? Nope, ignore that, hang on. This is a Google Slides problem. That's what this is, honestly, drives me bonkers. Okay. Let's see. Okay, one question. Oh, good question. How does merge sort split an odd number of elements? Uh, usually, the if there is an odd number of elements, uh, it usually goes from index zero to array dot length divided by two in the first half or the first recursive call, and then it goes from that midpoint to whatever the end of the array is in the second recursive call, so that like odd number usually ends up in the second array, if that helps answer your question. No questions about the exam. All right, cool. Take it to Ed. We're happy to talk about it. Also, if you for any reason have a conflict with the final exam, this is like your final chance to tell me about it so that we can maybe talk about any accommodations. Please don't send me an email the day of. It's really hard to help you. And then it's like uncomfortable for me and uncomfortable for you. Okay, cool. All right. What, we do? Oh, it happened? Thank you. Oh, okay. Um, da -da -da -da. Uh, when will midterm one resubmission, I assume grades? 
is the question there. Like I said, the TAs are still grading it. I've asked the TAs to finish their grading by this weekend. So as soon as those things come in, we will release them. Um, okay, cool. <laughs> All right, let's get back into it. So at the very end of lecture on Monday, I sort of teased a fourth sorting algorithm called QuickSort, great name. If you're gonna name an algorithm, name it after the thing you think it's best at, solid. So how does QuickSort work? Uh, remember that we sort of had these different types of sorting algorithms, different approaches. Uh, merge sort represents this context of divide and conquer. This is another one of those divide and conquer style algorithms. Now merge sort did this thing where it would just automatically split. Like the, the sort of main idea behind merge sort is like sorting an array of more than one element is too hard. So let's break it down to an array of one element, mark it as sorted, and then recombine sorted arrays together. Quick sort is sort of the opposite ordering where we're gonna say, put the logic in how we split the arrays, and then once we've split the arrays, we can just mash them together. So how does it work? Um, in the context of quick sort, we are going to pick what we call a pivot, and then we are going to split the array into technically three pieces. All of the items that come before the pivot the pivot, and all the items that come after the pivot. In this particular example, we are just picking a pivot to be whatever happens to sit at index zero of the array we are trying to split. Because it's unsorted, we don't know what's in there, we're just gonna make some choice about like, ah, whatever's in the very first index, that's what we're gonna use as our pivot. So here, in this first example, our pivot's eight, and then you can see it just moved through the array and it said, Hey, two, are you greater than or less than eight? You are less than, so it goes to the left array. 91, greater than or less than, greater than, so it goes to the right. 22, to the right. 55, to the right. One, to the left. Seven, to the left. Six, to the left. And so you can see it's just splitting. It didn't do any ordering. But we get it until it gets all the way down to singular elements. And if we do this pivot um, sort of split, 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 by the time we get down to singular elements, you can see then we ended up with everything in sorted order, and then all we have to do is just dump everything back into the array. Let's dive into it in more detail. So we pick a pivot, we divide. Now we need to pick a pivot of each of these subarrays that are not of size one. So the eight is officially in its final base case form. We don't need to keep splitting that array of one, but we've got an array of four, an array of three. So we're gonna again pick the pivot at the beginning. And then you can see we again end up with three separate items. Thankfully now two of those are singular items. There we go, we've got to split that one as well. And so then we just do one final split for those items. And then we can just recombine them. There we go, back into a final sorted array. This is the basics. I'm about to get a lot more complicated in terms of how to pick a good pivot. But does anyone have any questions at this point? Okay, cool. So, and here's more because that's grace. So, okay. So let's, let's think about the runtime and how the pivot impacts this. So, What is the absolute worst possible value of the pivot in comparison to the rest of the values in the array? Like what's the least convenient value to be hanging out at index zero? Yeah, one. And in this particular case, one because one represents what in relation to the rest of the items? Smallest value, absolutely. If I have a pivot, that represents the extreme end of the range of values, i.e. the smallest value, another correct way to think about this is the largest value, then when I split, I'm not really reducing the size of the input to my next method very much. And so if at each split, I only split off a single item, the pivot and then everything ends up to the right of it or everything ends up to the left, I'm going to hate, have to make a lot more recursive calls 
And the more recursive calls I have to make, the deeper into the call stack I get, the worse the runtime is. So I might represent that runtime with this type of recurrence, where you can see that I've got this n minus 1 as how the input changes. Not great, because that ends up being an n squared runtime, if you do all the math to find the close form of this recurrence. OK, what then is the best possible pivot? What's the ideal value that to, could be hanging out in an zero? Yeah, there in the back. The value that splits the array in the half, absolutely. Otherwise, maybe known as like the median value, for example, like this value that sort of sits in the middle of the collection. So if the val I find a, a pivot that perfectly splits every time, when I make those recursive calls, how is the input going to change? Instead of having that t of n minus 1, I would have t of what? Anyone? Ooh. Ooh, yes, I think those are related answers, right? Um, I agree. So I would say n over 2, which, you know, you can think of as logarithmic runtime, and then guess what? We find the closed form. That's where we get our n log n runtime from. Any questions on how we got to that sort of best case versus worst case? So you can see the pivot choice makes a big difference because that influences how many recursive calls we need to make to get down to the base case. So merge sort, like I said, is like the Beyonce of sorts. She comes up all the time. She's certainly the most popular. She will not go away. She lives on, all right? That's because we can do a bunch of funky math. Um, <laughs> and in practice, we consider merge sort to be an n log n runtime. And I'm going to show you all of the things that we do in order to get to an ideal pivot so that we are much more likely to end up with this n log n runtime. So if somebody asks you, what is the runtime of merge sort, they are expecting you to say back n log n. You are very smart, though, and you think, oh, there's technically this worst case scenario where it could be n squared. But like industry has forgotten that. They do not remember that Beyonce is a terrible actress. We only remember Lemonade, OK? <laughs> so now here's a question. What about stability? Is this a stable sort? Can we predictably keep equal values in the same order that they were given to us? Yeah. Yes. Yes, it is. Oh, wait, that's wrong. I disagree. It's a stable sort, right? Yeah. Oh, wait, sorry. Did my brain switch to merge sort halfway through this? Wow, y'all, you should sleep more. <laughs> that's exactly what just happened to my brain. My brain just straight up forgot that we were talking about merge sort and straight up went to, uh, thought we were talking about merge sort. Wow. <laughs> Ignore me. Ignore me. Um, okay, sorry, we're talking about quick sort. So quick sort is not a stable sort. And quick sort is not a stable sort because of all that moving from the different sides to the different sides. Sorry. Uh, and I will say in place, we're going to talk about that. Great. Um, okay, ignore my brain fart. Useful for. So here's the thing about quick sort is that we've got a lot more moving around of elements because they're moving around to different arrays. We're not just sort of like, you know, with merge sort, we were kind of starting from the beginning and working together. So this actually ends up doing a lot more comparisons, but it ends up compared to merge sort, it actually has better constant time factors. And so you will find that actually, if you go look up the Java documentation of how Java implements sorting, it uses a type of quick sort if they are primitive values. Even though it's the same complexity class as merge sort, uh, the quick sort actually does end up, like if you clock it timer-wise on ints, generally being much faster than merge sort. However, it's not stable and it doesn't apply quite as much. It does a lot more comparisons and comparing objects is much more expensive than comparing primitive values. And so we use merge sort for objects Technically, asterisks, we use Tim sort. Um, but we use a merge sort style thing for the 
objects, and then we use a quick sort for primitives. Sorry, questions there, I know that was confusing. I'm living in a different reality, yeah. Does quick sort usually work better just because statistically our data will be randomized? Ah, yes, this also does, um, as you can imagine, it does impact the runtime if our stuff is randomized, like you said, because that's going to impact the pivot, like we're more likely to get a good mid median pivot if things are randomized. If, for example, this was sorted, we would get really bad pivots every single time, right? So in a randomized collection of ints, quick sort's likely to be better then. Merge sort just runs n log n every single time, whether it's sorted, unsorted, randomized, whatever, you get this very predictable n log n runtime, which people like the predictability about it, that's why merge sort gets its day in the sunshine. Quick sort, it can be more optimized like this. But let's talk about how to pick these pivots. Okay, great. Um, okay, so we just looked at the way to find the pivot where you just take the first element, which is really inexpensive logic. It's constant time to find that pivot, right? Now the second one down, take the median of the ray. We know that's our ideal pivot, but in order to calculate that, we would have to loop over the entire array and do some math. So that's gonna incur some runtime to find the perfect pivot. So similar to when we designed our hash functions, because we're picking a pivot at like every single level of this uh, sort, we wanna pick one that's like effective, but isn't gonna incur so much extra runtime to pick it that we like erase all of the goodness of finding a good pivot. So we could do a few other things. We could take the median of like a sample of the array where we take the median where we just look at three elements, the item at the very beginning of the array, the item that's at the index that is the middle, and the item that's at the index of the end, and then we take the median of those three values. And so instead of looking at just one index, we look at three, but that's still constant time compared to the overall array. So we've like added a little bit of extra computation, but we're taking a few more things into a consideration and we're likely to get a better pivot. Or we could just pick a random. <laughs> and so picking a random, again, we're only looking at one index. It technically runs in constant time, but actually running the random algorithm has a little bit of runtime sort of cost to it that for us will, won't change the complexity class, but in the sort of stopwatch timer comparisons doesn't have great constants. So that's just a written out version of everything I just said aloud so you can read it yourself. The most common used one does end up being this sort of pick the median of the first, last, and middle. Because it's the sort of the right balance between, you know, we're doing a little bit of extra looking, but it's still constant time looking, and we've, we've increased the statistical probability of finding a better pivot. So the way that works is we would sort of look at three items. We would ask ourselves, which is the median of these three? So we're looking right now at eight, zero, and six. The median of eight, zero, and six is actually the value six. And so we move the pivot out of the way. And then we are going to loop over this array and we are going to move things that are before and after so that we end up here where we've now got this sort of idea and I've now changed this also to an in place algorithm. It's doing the same logic as before, but instead of creating separate arrays for the pivot and then a separate array for the before pivot and the after pivot, I've just sort of like moved them to different places within the array. It means I'm gonna need some more uh, variables to keep track of where in the original array each of these boundaries are, but it's saving me from creating whole new arrays. So now what we've done is we have added actually two optimizations to this. One, we're not using all of that memory space, but also remember that our most optimal access of memory is when we're all working within the same array, that magical contiguous memory. And so this really amplifies those constant factors that come with the quick and quick sort. 
So now we have moved to a better pivot and an in place, and this is more like the version of quicksort that Java actually uses. This also, as you can imagine, is part of why it's so much faster on primitives. It's really fast to swap primitives around, but if they were objects, I would have to find the reference stored in the array and travel to the object and call the compare to's and all that sort of stuff, which the constant factors aren't great for. Great. Cool. There we go. Cool. Okay. Any questions about quick sort? Okay. Great. We've got more sorts. Okay. This one hopefully should be pretty fast. Uh, I mentioned a third uh, approach to sorting is what if we had a structure that already automatically sort of sorted things and kept them in an ordered fashion? Enter heap sort. All we do is we take our set of items, we run that algorithm, remember Floyd's build heap algorithm? It's that one where we run percolate down on everything row by row of the tree, and that actually gets us to go from the collection of data into heap structure in linear time. And then we just call remove min, n times. So we've got a linear time to take our original input and put it into heap format. And then we call remove min for every value of n. What is the runtime of a remove min on a heap? Yes. Log n, absolutely. So I've got a runtime of n log n. Great. What do we think the best case runtime is? Does this change? Is there a difference? Oh, now this is interesting. So we have to run n in order to get the original set of data into the heap, but imagine if it so happened that after we put it into the heap, it actually just ended up in the array in sorted order. That could happen, and then when I do all that um, like moving through the array, I don't have any more percolations or anything like that to do, okay? But in practice, very rare, uh, we end up with n log n runtime, so we think of this as an n log n runtime. Um, it's not stable because we're doing a lot of percolating and moving around, um, and so we have theoretically thought of the heap right as the tree. You had to implement a heap with an array. We just saw an in-place quicksort where we sort of like sectioned off pieces of the array well, we can do that as well. Here is a version of in place heap sort. So right now you can imagine what I've got is I've taken my set of values and I've run Floyd's build heap on them. So they're in heap order. I didn't draw the tree. But then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna call remove min. So I'm gonna take the item at index zero, which is always gonna be the min value. Once I remove min, that means I sort of have one fewer item stored in what I call the heap section of the array, and I'm going to pull the thing from the very end of the heap to replace it, right? So since I'm going to do that, it's really convenient because the thing I'm gonna move into index zero also frees up a space that's now sort of outside of the bounds of the heap. And if I call remove min again, then I sort of just keep building up this sorted portion while shrinking down the heap portion. So this way I can use an in-place heap sort, but it will still run in n log n runtime. The only weird thing about this is, is with this particular format, it actually ends up putting it in reverse sorted order, meaning the smallest value will end up at the last value of the index, and the greatest value end up at index zero, which I don't know, maybe you need? That would be cool. Or you just gotta loop over it again and pull things out in reverse order. Yes. Yes, you could totally do a max heap instead of a min heap, and then exactly, you would end up in exactly the right order that you want. So totally up to you. Great. So there we go. Okay. Any questions about heap sort? Great, okay, perfect timing. Now we're gonna wrap up with two kind of different approaches to sorting. 
So remember, everything that I've sort of shown you before is what we call a comparison sort. This next item, bucket sort, technically is a type of comparison sort but we're starting to head in a direction where we recognize that items have an inherent sorted order. So bucket sort or bin sort is another name you might find on the internet. It works if you know you have a range of values from one to let's use the uh, variable name k. We're gonna create an array of size k so that there are k buckets in the array and then we are going to run through our collection of data and quickly sort it into these buckets. Now, if our array is originally int values from the int, say, 1 or 0 to the int k, like, say, this, well, then it's really convenient because what I'm going to do is I'm going to make an array of those ranges. And then instead of actually moving the data around, I'm just going to count how many occurrences of those ints end up, which is a really efficient thing, right? It's like I'm just almost like hashing them in a way. It's kind of like letter inventory, but it's like int inventory. And so I'm just moving from the very start of the collection to the very end of the collection. And every time I see a new int, I increase the count in that particular bucket. Now that I've got things in these buckets, I just have to loop over this uh, supplemental structure that I've got and print out the number of ints. So it's like, oh, well, I went through and I counted that there's three ones. Well, now I just need to put three ones at the very beginning of my array, followed by one, two, followed by two threes, followed by four fours, and then finally three fives. OK. What do we think the runtime of this is? What do we think the runtime of looping over the original set and putting it into this bucket? What's the, what's the runtime of that? N. We just go from the front to the back, we count things up. What about the runtime from this set of buckets? We have k buckets representing n items. Anybody? It's a little tricky. Yeah? Yes, it is very intentionally actually k plus n. <coughs> And this is this thing, because we're going to loop over the buckets. There's k buckets. So your intuition's correct. But then we have to like produce the like n actual entries into the final array. And so we have the loop over the buckets. That's k. And we know we're going to produce eventually n items. So we end up with O of k plus n. But this is not technically simplified. Right now, we don't know how big k is. Right? But if we know that there's a range, and the range, let's say, is pretty close in value to n, meaning there's not that many duplicates. If there's like a lot of duplicates, then k is going to be significantly smaller than n. If there's like a huge range and not that many values, maybe k is a lot bigger than n. But based on the relationship between k and n, we can maybe make a deterministic point of view on whether we drop one of those values. Like we could maybe figure out whether one of those values bounds the other. But we would sort of represent this as a total runtime of k plus n, because we don't technically know that in this particular situation. Questions on this? Wow, that's so helpful. It's so nice to be able to do this with ints. Wouldn't it be cool if we could do that with other pieces of data? We can kind of do that. <laughs> so um, we can do this with other types of data. But the thing is, is we have to have some deterministic way to find buckets. So the buckets rely on a type of data that has sort of an inherent sorted order to it that the computer already understands, like ints or doubles or characters. Those all kind of have inherent sorted order. So. Let's try it on some doubles. What we would do here is we're going to use the largest of the significant digits, like the leftmost significant digit. I know math. And what we're going to do is we're now, instead of using counts, we're going to store each of these items as a list. 
So now we've got sort of broken things up and we've got a collection of lists in each of these buckets. And then what we're gonna do is we will sort the buckets. And then we end up just looping over the buckets just like we did previously to get the final sorted order. Yeah, question? Exactly. So if we were doing strings, that kind of thing, we would do this by character by character. We use the leftmost character, and we would use the ASCII to int mapping to get that. Yes. How are we these Great question. So in this particular situation, um, I'm going to use insertion sort. Now, if you, I, I think it's on my very last slide. A bunch of wonderful researchers have gone out into the world and asked, like, okay, like. I know insertion source has a worst case runtime of n squared, but because merge sort has to make a bunch of extra arrays and quick sort's gotta do a bunch of recursion, is there actually sort of a tipping point in the size of the things that you're sorting where insertion sort just runs faster and the, apparently the number is 48? So if you have a collection of primitive values that's 48 or under, statistics tell us that insertion sort will probably be the fastest. So since we have split these things up into buckets, if we have an even distribution of values, kind of like when we think about hashing, if we had an even distribution, each of those sort of separate chains hanging off of the hash are pretty short, and that's our like, intention here, that when we have an even distribution of values, each of these individual buckets that we gotta go sort is gonna be pretty small, so we're just calling insertion sort on a small subset of values. So the first two run times to get it into the buckets and then to get it from the buckets into the final thing are the same as the previous uh, slide. But if we're using insertion sort, then a worst case scenario is what if everything just ended up in the same bucket? Then we're just running insertion sort which is really annoying. That's sort of like the degenerate case here where we sort of just have everything stuffed in one bucket. But what if we had everything perfectly distributed across all the buckets, then insertion sort essentially doesn't have to do any sorting at all. I remember insertion sort can identify if something's already in sorted order. It's just like, oh, cool, great. Don't need to do anything. So the range between best and worst case is dominated by the sorting algorithm that you use for each bucket. And the best case scenario is that it just runs in sort of k time, the number of buckets. So, for ints, for int values, because we don't have to do that resorting per bucket, actually our best case runtime is O of k plus n, and chances are that k, the range, will be close to n or bounded by it. So actually, the worst case runtime actually ends up as O of n, which is incredible. <laughs> But the worst case runtime, if we have that degenerate situation, if we have like data that's not in, so we have to run insertion sort, then we could theoretically end up with an n squared. At this point, you might be like, Casey, don't we want to, in that case, maybe we use merge sort or quick sort on the buckets instead? And I would say, yeah, you're right. So if you want to protect yourself, you could use a different sorting algorithm per bucket. Because that n squared is just being, like this runtime is just dominated by the sort I use per bucket. Because it's linear time to get it into the buckets. The best case runtime is just, oh, then, great. Now, the in-practice runtime, if somebody asks you, again, what is the runtime of bucket sort, they are expecting you probably to say back linear runtime, but that is dependent on a couple things. One, it's dependent on the fact that K and N are pretty close or that K is like bounded, like maybe it's just all digits and the total number of K could be 10, you know, there's 10 digits. And also that you have an even distribution or a randomized distribution of values so that we just have each bucket's a pretty small list in there. So we're avoiding that degenerate situation. It could be stable because we're using insertion sort. It is definitely not in place, unfortunately. And so uh, it is useful when K is small. We don't have many duplicates. Um, but it's not very good when k is super big compared to n because then we have to make an array that could store any possible value. Like maybe we're doing strings, but we're not using any special characters. You would still make 
one of those bucket counters for each of the possible characters, and that could be a lot of wasted memory. Yeah? In this case, more than they are duplicates? You're right, sorry, yes. Okay, really quickly, one final, final sort for you. Radix sort is not a comparison sort at all. This only works for ints or doubles or strings, and it is the idea that we go digit by digit and we put things into buckets based on their digits and we just constantly keep running bucket sort digit by digit. So we go and we put everything into a bucket based on its ones and then we spit out an array where everything's sorted by the ones uh, place. And then we put it into a bucket based on the 10 space, and then we produce an array that's sorted by the 10s. And then we put it into a final hundreds, because I only had up to 100 items, or 1,000, I guess you would say in this case. And then we end up finally with a sorted order. So radix sort just takes bucket sort, applies it to, say, integer values, runs bucket sort digit by digit, and this also ends up running in linear time then. Okay. Good job, everyone. That officially ends our sorting. Uh, there's a bunch of videos on these slides. If you want to watch all the algorithms play, you can look at Visual Algo. Thank you so much. Please come back on Friday. We're going to talk about dynamic programming. Yay.